morning. morning and welcome. We have um, a few new things today. You see in your bulletin, there's a new bulletin. You should have the dark blue bulletin now for the fall. And in that bulletin, we've added the communion service. So today being Communion Sunday, after the prayers and after the prayer of the Lord's Prayer, it'll have a little comment in there, turn to page 9. And so at that point, you turn to page 9 and you follow along with the communion part of the service. And next week, when we don't have communion, you ignore that part. Make sense? Wonderful, good. Also during communion, because many of you have been here before, but I'm going to review it anyway. During communion, what we're going to do is what we've done the last few months. I will consecrate the wine and the bread, bless it, bring it forth, inviting you. I will walk down to the back of the church at the end. I invite you then to come out, respectfully, respecting each other's distance, come down the center aisle, if you don't want communion, simply go out the side aisles. If you do want communion, come down the center aisle, take a handkerchief out of the aisle, put it in the palm of your hand. I will then give you the wine and the bread together into that handkerchief. And then you may depart receiving the body of Christ. Do you make sense? Well, three of you said yes, okay. <laughs> and if you're at home, sorry, you don't have to listen to this at all and ignore it. So, but if you're at home, you're in a special treat. If you guys are here, you will hear it. But I encourage you to watch the video at home if you're able. As I've been told, the prelude today is a French horn ensemble. You will listen to it. You will hear it. It will play. But you will miss out on the opportunity to see Michael Lobal in four times playing together. Beauty of computers. He can play the French horn and then meld it all together so it looks like he's a four-person ensemble. That's supposed to be on the video today. Also, we have a special music of the day, which I'm looking forward to. And so we'll talk about that a little later. Are there any other announcements anybody would like to share? Not seeing or hearing any. I would ask us now to open our hearts, open our minds, as we do prepare to worship, praising God and giving thanks, as we hear the French word ensemble.
Let us please rise. We gather this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sins in the presence of our God and of each other. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, 
in the glory of God the Father, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of all the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now open our hearts to hear the word of God. The synopsis of this reading states, After a hymn of praise acknowledging God as a shelter for the poor, the prophet portrays a wonderful victory banquet at which death, which in ancient Canaan was depicted as a monster swallowing up everyone, will be swallowed up forever. The prophet urges celebration of this victory of salvation. This reading is from the 25th chapter of Isaiah, starting with the first verse. A reading from Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next reading is from the fourth chapter of Philippians, starting with the ninth of the first verse. Uh, the synopsis states, Though writing from prison and facing an uncertain future, Paul calls on the Philippians to rejoice and give thanks to God no matter what the circumstance. God's peace is with us and binds together our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ, especially when things around us do not seem peaceful. St. Paul writes, My brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Sintish to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us please rise. Hallelujah. Lord, to whom shall we go? 
you have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Gospel reading for this Sunday, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, is taken from St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the ears of our hearts be truly open to the word of God this day. Amen. I don't have a new sermon for you this week. This sermon just is the same as last week's. Because it must be important because Jesus is still talking about it. You remember for the last few weeks we've been hearing parables of Jesus talking to the crowds on the Temple Mount. For three weeks he's told parables and today he tells another parable. It's all in the same part of the Bible. It follows right after each other. Jesus is trying to drive home a point. It all started earlier when a few weeks ago we had a parable of Jesus telling the crowd about the people that went to work. The vineyard owner who needed workers. And he picks them at 6 o'clock and at 9 o'clock and at 12 o'clock and at 3 o'clock and at 5 o'clock. And at the end of the day they all received the same pay. And in this parable, Jesus is saying, everyone gets God's grace. Everyone is invited to God's love. It doesn't matter if you come to faith early in life, in midlife, or late in life. Everyone receives God's love. But the Pharisees, the chief priests and the Sadducees, the people in charge of the Temple Mount, are disturbed. Who does he think he is saying this? They think they're the ones who decide who is righteous and who isn't righteous. Who is good and who is bad. They're the ones that are the keepers of the law. They know God's will. They know the scriptures. They dictate it to the people. And Jesus is here on their temple mount saying that all people are invited to God's grace and to God's kingdom, and they're angry. But Jesus knows what's in their heart. And so we get the next parable. 
This one targets them a little bit more. Jesus turns to the crowd, knowing what's in the Pharisees' hearts, what's in the Sadducees' hearts, what's in the chief priests' hearts. And he turns to the crowd and says, there was a vineyard owner that had two sons. One son faked it and said, yes, I'll do anything you want, Dad. I'll say, oh, sure. He said everything right, but he never did it. And then there's the other son who wasn't perfect, wasn't always good, didn't really want to do it, but he ends up doing the will of the Father. And Jesus is pointing out right there on the Temple Mount, there's some people who say, yes, we are the righteous ones. Yes, we are the good sons. Yes, we are the faithful. But they're not. And as you can imagine, the crowds are looking at the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the chief priests. Because they know what Jesus is intending here. And those Pharisees and Sadducees are getting more angry. Because Jesus has just called them out. And they're angry. And their hearts are burning with resentment. And Jesus again, knowing what's in their hearts, tells yet another parable. He says, a vineyard owner put up a, a wall, built a garden, put in the plants, took care of everything, put the tower up, put in the pit for storage, put in the wine press, then leased it to people to take care of it. And when the harvest came, he sent his slaves to get his due. And they rejected his servants. They rejected his prophets. Over and over again, they reject his prophets. Jesus' implication is they have rejected the God's word, God's messengers. And in the parable, Jesus says, eventually the owner says, I will send my son. And they will honor him and respect him. And they kill the son. And they beat him. And Jesus asked, what should happen to these vineyard owners, these vineyard workers, these people who think they know what's best? And the crowd say, we should destroy them. They should be killed. The vineyard owner will come home and he will demand his due and destroy them and give it to someone else. And again, <laughs> The Pharisees and Sadducees are standing there going, he's talking about us. He's saying that we have mistreated our management of God's house. And they're getting even more angry, which you probably would understand. They're getting a little bit more resentful. And at this point, Matthew tells us they turn and plot to how to arrest him. But they're afraid of the crowd, the people listening. But they're so angry, they just want to arrest him and get rid of him, be quiet, destroy him, kill him. Which we know is what's about to happen. And Jesus knows what's about to happen. And at this point, again, Jesus knows what's in their heart, knows their anger. Anger enough to kill him. He tells yet this parable. This parable we get today. It takes a little bit further, doesn't it? A king has a wedding banquet for his son. He invites the people to come. He sends out the invites. And they have rejected it. They have said, we're too important. We've got other things to do. We've got other business. They invite you to come and receive a gift from God. God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. And you say, I don't have time. I don't need that. I have more important things to do. And this time Jesus says what's going to happen to them. He doesn't ask the crowds. This time he drives home the point even more. He says the king will be enraged. And he will send out his troops. And he will round up those murderous wretches. And they will be killed. And besides that, their cities will be burned. They will be destroyed. And the king will invite others. And he sends out the servants to invite all people, good and bad, everyone out there, to come to the banquet, to come to the feast. 
Because all people are invited to receive God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. But then Jesus continues on and adds a little part to this parable. Just another part. Where now the people are there, everybody's assembled, and the king comes in and notices one of the guests. He's not wearing a robe. It seems like an odd little addition. It seems a little weird. Well, he's at the wedding. He's there in the party house. Why does the king get so upset? And I thought about it, and I thought about what happened just a few weeks ago. Because we've all been to weddings, and we've enjoyed weddings, and we enjoy the receptions. A few weeks ago, my niece was getting married down in North Carolina. Sarah had planned, Sarah and Matt had planned a wedding for 150 people. And they were going to have it on the grounds, the beautiful grounds of the Durham Life and Science Museum. And they had sent out the invites. And then the coronavirus came. And that changed it. Because North Carolina mandated you can only have 25 people gathered together outside. And so they had a cut down from 150 to 25. And they already had 12 people in the wedding party. Besides, they had to count the five museum workers. So that left them eight people they could invite. Me and Shalene didn't make the cut. They wanted their parents there. <laughs> they wanted grandparents, huh? But we didn't make the cut, but they, uh, they established something else for us. They did a live streaming of it. Age of computers. What computers can do. I loved it. We could sit at home. We didn't have to dress up. We didn't have to travel. We didn't even have to smile. Because they couldn't see us. And we could watch the whole wedding. We watched them assemble and, and gather and talk about it for a half hour before the wedding. Then we watched the wedding live. And then we watched after the wedding for a bit. Because the camera was there showing everything. And a lot of them didn't know they were on camera. But we saw it all. And it was interesting because you could watch and see what people are saying and they're talking about before the wedding, after the wedding, during the wedding. And also this website had a little thing on the side where you could make comments. And friends and family were making comments. Little well wishes. And I, I wrote a prayer for them. That God would bless their marriage together. But I also noticed that not everybody wrote good comments. Because with the beauty of age of computers, anybody can watch it. Anybody can hack a system. Anybody can figure out the big code, Matt and Sarah's wedding. So maybe these comments were not respectable. A few of them didn't belong there. Even though they couldn't be watching it, because it was open to everybody. They shouldn't have been there. We don't even know if they were friends or family or anybody that anybody knew. But everybody would be able to see it. And anybody could make a comment. So it wasn't always the best, most sacred comment. And that's the same thing Jesus is driving home here. Even though some get into the party, you still have to embrace it. You still have to embrace that love. Receive that grace. Receive that forgiveness. To wear it. To hold on to it. In the first century, it was common practice that a host of a wedding would provide wedding garments for the visitors. It's not like the man came into the wedding banquet not knowing this was protocol. Or it was offered to him. It's not like he could say, well, I couldn't afford one. I didn't know where they were. It was common practice to provide them. They were there. They were free. He chose not to put it on. He showed disrespect. He didn't want to embrace the wedding. He didn't want to embrace the celebration. Jesus is implying, again, all people are invited, good and bad. All people are invited to God's banquet, to come to God's house, to be receiving His grace, His love. We have to be open to it. We have to embrace it. We have to wear it. 
We have to put it on and claim it. Sometimes it's so easy not to. In this year of pandemic and COVID, it's so easy to slush it off and say, oh, I got other things to do, I got other worries to do. I got other needs. But now more than ever, we need to embrace that faith. To receive that grace, to hear of God's love. Paul talks about it in that second reading that Michael read to you. That second reading from Philippi. Paul is in prison. He doesn't know his future. He doesn't know what's coming. But he's writing to friends in Philippi, to the Christian church in Philippi. And at the end of his writing, at the end of the letter, he commends to him some friends, but he also tells them that above everything else, not what wealth you have, what greatness you are, how much abilities you have, what educations you have, above all that, Receive Jesus Christ. Cling to Jesus Christ. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on living in the ways of Christ. Receive the grace of God. That is what is of value. That is what is the greatest. Receive the love of God. God loves us. We must be open to it and receive it. May we receive it this day. This is the parables that we've been hearing. If we haven't heard the lesson yet, hear it today. Open your heart. Open your mind. Put on Jesus Christ. Receive that grace. Receive that love. And share it with others. More than anything else, this is what is of value. Jesus Christ and His love. For He loves you. He died for you. He gives you His grace. Receive that love now and always. Amen. And may the peace and grace of God be with you this day and throughout this week to come. Amen. At this time, thinking about that, with Jesus' love, I'm inviting the Sunday School Choir to come forward, or at least some of them that are here. Some of them are recorded previously, singing individually. So you're going to hear them singing, but they're also going to play some music with their own singing. And they're going to do sign language. You'll probably recognize the song.
Did you all recognize the song? Oh good, three of you did. <laughs> Jesus loves me. It reminds us that Jesus does love us. That God loves us so. Let us celebrate and give thanks this day. Receiving that love in communion, in God's word and God's promises. Let us now confess our faith, trusting and hoping in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Seeking the grace and the mercy of God, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, rejoice in your church. Welcome your children to the banquet table that you have prepared. Nourish us with your faith, your spirit, your grace, and then send us forth to go and invite others to come and hear of your blessings and your mercy that we receive in Jesus Christ. Come, hear us, O God. Almighty Creator, your creation stretches out before us, and yet we know we are limited, and everything we strive to possess is limited. But the love you have for your people is endless. Wash away all pains and sickness that plague us. Bring a calm to troubled and violent minds. Bring peace and comfort to those struggling from loss of life or home due to shootings, war, violence, fires, floods, storms, or disease. We pray for all your world this day, asking for your winds of renewal to bring your peace. Come, hear us, O God. Healing, Lord, bring comfort to all those who are suffering or in pain. Grant your spirit to be with those recovering from surgery or needing surgery, those needing healing spiritually, mentally, or physically. We lift up before you today our shut-ins, our hospitalized, and especially all those we name now in our prayers to you. Come, hear us, O God. Eternal Father, we lift up those who have ended their journey in this life and have now entered into your kingdom's promise. Today we grieve the loss of loved ones, cherished parents, spouses, children, friends, and neighbors. And we pray especially for all those who grieve and suffer this day. In you we know that there is life everlasting. Until we join with them in that eternal promise, hold us in the communion with all gathered united in your heavenly banquet. Come, hear us, O God. We pray, gracious Lord, comforted by your presence, trusting in your fulfilling word, and seeking the fulfillment of your kingdom. Until that day we join with you in the everlasting promise, we pray the words your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy name.
in the day when he comes again to judge the world in righteousness. And so we give thanks in our hearts and seek to receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy soul. Amen. In the night which he betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for remembrance of me. Come with repentant hearts to receive the forgiveness of the Lord and the gift of His life. And then may you go forth in joy and peace, renewed as witnesses to the glory of the coming King. 